Okay, guys, so uh, our last speaker of the symposium is uh, Jeffrey Miller, professor of psychology at the University of New Mexico. Once he finishes and we're done with, the Q with his Q&A, please don't leave because I have some, uh, you know, two, three, five minutes of closing remarks. And then we open it up for you guys if you want to come up to us, uh, say hello, ask questions, whatever you want. Thanks, guys. Take it away, Jeff. Thanks. So you guys have been very patient. We've had a lot of great talks, a huge amount of information. Some of you have been sitting there for two and a half hours without a break. So let me take a minute and ask you all to stand up, please, and just, just do a little stretch. Just reach up, just tiptoes, whatever works. Stretch it on out. Get some blood flowing. Yeah, that's it. OK. Good. OK, stop. Sit down. Come on, get serious. I'm going to talk about virtue signaling um, by consumers and companies. And to follow on from Doug Kenrick's points this morning, right? you can contrast the traditional expected utility perspective of economics, which is sort of a lot of utility graphs, versus like uh, the Kahneman and Tversky heuristics and biases literature that's all about sort of how dumb we are in certain domains. First is a kind of Darwinian rationality perspective. And I obviously love the Darwinian rationality perspective. I think pe people like Gerrit Gigerenzer have done a great job of integrating the notion of adaptive function with um, some of the methods and insights of the heuristics and biases school. But I think all three of those are kind of missing a trick they're missing some key insights from signaling theory, which I've been using for about 20 years to try and understand human behavior. So the question for consumer behavior in particular is when consumers make purchases, how often are those really tools for maximizing subjective expected utility in a traditional economics framework versus are they signals for appearing virtuous to potential mates, friends, neighbors, allies, co-workers, other citizens, etc. Or to put a finer point on it, if you're a vegan who also does CrossFit, what do you tell people first, right, when you walk into a room? Because CrossFitters are notorious for bragging about it, but so are vegans, and this identity does exist. Virtue signaling has gotten a lot of attention, particularly in the US, um, before and, and since the 2016 election. It's typically used as a term of abuse by conservatives towards sort of social justice warriors and activists for making fun of everything they do is sort of just pretend, right? It's trendy. It's a way of showing off I am superior to, to thou. I'm woker than thou. And I think there's a lot of merit to that. And if you follow me on Twitter, you know that. But. I think there's also virtue signaling by conservatives and by the religious and by centrists and by libertarians. I think everybody does it. I think it's a universal human instinct to do virtue signaling. So my goal here is not to argue that it's bad or maladaptive or that it causes massive economic problems, but rather to try to level up how we do it, how well we do it, and particularly how well marketers understand it. So with political virtue signaling, for example, you got people wearing stuff on their heads, right, that shows off what they consider to be the virtues that matter to them. So if it's conservatives in America, right, it's make America great again hats. And the virtues being displayed are virtues that maybe some on the left might not even consider virtues, like patriotism, Loyalty, in-group loyalty, respect for authority, stuff that John Haidt has learned are actually considered virtues by some people, but that many on the left don't, don't really think about. On the other hand, the so-called pussy hats for the Women's March, right, the pink knitted hats, knit them at home or buy them on Etsy, right, they're displaying virtues of respect for women and feminist values and care and justice and so forth. So in my view, these are equally virtue signals. And to the extent that people buy these hats, they're also consumer products. 
And there are really entire social media platforms that are devoted almost entirely to people uh, signaling their virtue. One of them is called Twitter. And there are hundreds of millions of people on it. And most of what they do on that platform is trying to show off, I'm a good person because I believe these things that I articulate verbally here. So, what is virtue signaling? It's showing off your virtues to others in more or less credible ways, and what makes them credible we can explore later. And it can include many different aspects of the economy. It can include consumers buying so-called ethical brands, or things where they think, if I buy this, I'm a better person because of it. It can be companies promoting vision statements that attempt to articulate these are the distinctive virtues of our corporate culture. It could be shareholders doing ethical investment or impact investing or uh, getting advice from GiveWell about where do I invest if I want to have the most um, ethical impact. Or it could simply be employees wanting to have a sense that I work for a good company with good values that does something useful in the world and maybe I'm even willing to take a pay cut to do that like to work for a nonprofit. So all throughout the supply chain, all throughout corporate management, all throughout consumer decision making, you can probably see the tracks of virtue signaling. Now, I know you guys are tired, and I saw that I was going to be one of the last talks of the day. So I figured, well, should I give 11 empirical studies that are really intricate and require a lot of attention, or should I just talk about this? Um, so. I decided to go with the first option. Now, uh, this is a theoretical review talk, and there's a lot of eye candy, because it's like the end of the day. I will say, as, as sort of backstory, my view on all this has been informed by a few um, key developments in my career. One is just thinking about signaling in general for about 20 years in the context of sexual selection theory, and what makes sexual ornaments reliable. And then about 10 years ago, I did a paper called Sexual Selection for Moral Virtues that tried to give a virtue signaling analysis of a lot of human uh, moral instincts. Um, I've also been informed pretty deeply by being involved in the last few years in a movement called Effective Altruism, which is trying to kind of explicitly fight against virtue signaling in the charity sector and trying to figure out how do you actually do good in the world and not just pretend to do good. And then the last couple of years on Twitter, I have learned a lot about virtue signaling from all sides because that's, that's what the platform is for. And particularly weeks like last week, OMG, there was a lot of it. So what, how do you interpret if, uh, let's say, a male consumer here with a good, strong, high digit ratio um, buys something like Grounds for Change coffee? where Grounds for Change Coffee is being promoted as fair trade, organic, shade grown, carbon free. I don't think you actually want an organic coffee, but whatever. Um, it's marketed as having all the virtues you might want in a coffee bean. Okay, maybe he's buying it because he has learned from bitter experience that the coffee is just better in terms of delivering subjective expected utility to him. But more likely, it's for the audience, right? If he takes home a date or has a little dinner party and he serves this coffee, the hope will be that his guests will react positively, right? And go, basically, my hero. Shade grown, awesome, carbon free, awesome. I love you. You're, you're a virtuous man. And then the little skeptic down in the lower right is asking the signaling question. Are you a hero or are you just showing off personality traits considered virtuous to gain social, sexual, and status benefits without necessarily delivering real benefits to others? And, and that's sort of where I'm at. The, the skeptical date. So consumers signal their virtues in lots of ways to multiple, to multiple audiences, right? To their friends, their mates, their rivals, relatives, co-workers, neighbors, anybody they could see um, who could observe them using the product or buying the product or owning it, or anybody they could talk about the product with, which is virtually anybody in their lives. 
And they can do this through both goods and services at any stage of buying, using, displaying, discussing, or even reviewing them online, right? You can virtue signal by reviewing the product on Amazon later, even if you return it. And what they're doing, I think, is maximizing apparent virtues, not maximizing subjective expected utility. And yet, most consumer research does not explicitly analyze people's virtue signaling strategies. Um, they might analyze, how does this make you feel? Do you like it? Would you talk to other people about it? And the kind of built-in assumption is even word of mouth is driven by the customer's reaction to the quality of the good or service, not driven by the consumer's need to virtue signal. Right? But also companies, brands, and products signal their virtues, and not just to consumers but also to their own workers, their investors, their rivals, their suppliers, retailers, regulators, et cetera, anybody who's a stakeholder, anybody who has an interest in a company. And often, if a company is doing something a little weird, like they're doing a PR campaign and the consumers aren't reacting to it, it's not necessarily irrational because the intended audience for a company's virtue signaling policy might be, for example, government regulators who might be trying to break up a monopoly, potentially, not the consumers themselves. And how do companies signal their virtues? Through the company name itself, through their slogan, like, don't be evil. Remember that? Remember, don't be evil? Um, hashtag not applicable in China. Um, hashtag James the Moore. Um, and the, sl the slogans have to be like virtue signaling if they're just brutally honest slogans where they actually cut to the chase and explain the, the product on offer that's, that's in a genuine way like Taco Bell because we're open and you're stoned <laughs> like that'll never fly because that'll spook the investors they can advertise virtues through the vision statement, policies, publicity, advertising, promotions, product design, product features. And this is all very easy to satirize, right? Because consumers and satirists kind of know this is cheap talk, right? A lot of this is, you could call companies out on it, but it doesn't really hold them as accountable as you might want. Like nobody who thought the firing of James the Moore from Google was really bad and, and unethical got Google to reconsider their position by reminding them, but you guys said don't be evil. Google doesn't care. But here again, most companies do not explicitly and consciously analyze and optimize their virtue signaling strategies, right? All their PR euphemisms notwithstanding, they don't actually hire like signaling theory experts from game theory to come in and say, okay, we're gonna optimize our, our signals to all of these stakeholders. How do we do it? How do we do it credibly? All right, let's take a step back. What is this virtue signaling stuff? Um, I think it goes back at least to Aristotle, but also to lots of other folks in um, uh, the philosophical traditions of China and India talk about similar things. Virtue ethics, right? Aristotle saying, what really matters is not necessarily how much utility you provide to others, like in later utilitarianism. It's not following Kantian categorical imperatives. It's simply developing yourself into a good person who's full of virtues and good habits. Then Darwin came along and kind of hidden in The Descent of Man and Selection in Relation to Sex, his best book, I think, is the idea that mate choice, sexual selection, can actually favor altruism. A very neglected idea after Darwin. But he actually was pretty clear about this, that he thought a lot of human virtues were there as sexually selected signals from one sex to the other, or vice versa, or both. And then Nietzsche gave his groundbreaking analysis that both pagan and Christian virtues were not just virtues, they were biological strategies that involved quite a bit of signaling and a lot of adaptive self-deception. The real breakthrough, I think, came with Thorsten Veblen 
with the theory of the leisure class, 1899, where he pointed out that conspicuous consumption and, and conspicuous charity and conspicuous educational credentials, like elite university degrees, are all kind of virtue signals in a way and can be analyzed using a signaling theory yet to be invented. Then in 1973, we had Michael Spence, an economist, again pointing out that college degrees are hard to fake IQ signals and that's their main value. It's not you learn a lot in college. It's just hard to get into college. So it's an IQ signal. Um, more recently, um, Brian Kaplan has made that point. And then in the mid-70s, Amon Zahavi kind of came full circle back to, back to Darwin's insights that many animal ornaments are costly, reliable signals that are there because of sexual selection or social selection more generally. So there's a sort of 2,300-year history of research on virtues and virtue signaling, but it hasn't really made it very much into um, consumer psychology yet. Now, virtue signaling um, has some benefits, and it also has some pretty serious costs, and I think it's important to be honest and open about these. So benefits of consumerist virtue signaling, like buying the shade-grown coffee. Well, it, it is a good strategy for appearing good, right? It does seem to succeed in that. Um, People talk about their apparently virtuous purchases, and other people don't typically call them out on it and say, that's just empty cheap talk. Right? There's this kind of social norm that says you're supposed to respect it and go, oh, good for you, well done, yay. Also, the virtue signals seem to work functionally pretty well to attract mates and friends, at least in terms of assortative socializing. Right? If you go out in public and wear your MAGA hat, <clears throat> you might repel a lot of people, but you might attract other people and the ones you want to attract. Depending on the signal, your virtue um, signaling consumer purchase might display desirable cognitive and personality traits like intelligence or openness or kindness. Some of this can motivate real altruism beyond the family and the tribe. Like when you brag about, I give money to childhood poverty in Africa. And also, I'm not really against hypocrisy. I think hypocrisy is okay. Hypocrisy is simply when you try to encourage everybody to follow role models and moral norms that you don't always have the strength of will to follow yourself. And that's fine. So virtue signaling can kind of help coordinate a society on a particular set of of moral values, even if nobody in the society fully uh, behaves according to them. On the other hand, there's some pretty serious problems with virtue signaling. First, it didn't really help to evolve, evolve to help other sentient beings in any particularly efficient way. Right? Other theories of altruism, kin selection, reciprocal altruism, um, group selection, tend to deliver real benefits to others. Virtue signaling does not necessarily do that. So you can pretend to help strangers, but you might not really be helping them at all. You might be throwing money into some charitable endeavor that either gets um, taken away by um, corrupt charity managers, or that leads to interventions that don't actually do anything or that are extremely ineffective cost-wise. Or you can do things that try to help non-human animals, but that are extremely inefficient, as we'll see in a minute. So virtue signaling is not a good strategy generally for actually doing good. So if doing good is your goal, virtue signaling might not help. Why? Well, because signal reliability depends on the costs imposed on the signaler. In this case, like how much money do you give away? How much time or energy do you give away to a cause? Signal reliability does not depend on what benefits are actually delivered to others. Like is the charity effective? If you go to a charity gala event and you go around asking people, hey, do you happen to have seen any, any quantitative reports on the actual impact of what we're doing here on human or, or animal well-being? 
you, you kind of be kicked out because that's a pretty rude question. But that's a mark of a virtue signaling system. It also wastes a lot of time, energy, and resources, like the charity gala balls, where you raise maybe $60,000 at the cost of throwing a half million dollar ball. Um, and it also leads to driving a lot of public moralizing, a lot of public shaming of people who don't uh, support your, your pet cause, a lot of vanity charity, a lot of sentimental policies that don't actually do much good, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the Kids Wish Network I have up here where like some kid's dying of cancer and they're eight and they want some spectacular thing to happen like Spider-Man Parade or whatever. And they raise half a million dollars to do that. And it seems gauche to ask, what else could you have done with that half million dollars? You could have saved 2,000 kids in Africa from malaria, whatever. You're not allowed to ask that. So here's an example of the contrast between a virtue signaling perspective versus an effective altruism perspective. So EA is a new social movement. It's been around five or 10 years, spearheaded by Peter Singer and a bunch of Oxford moral philosophers. And it wants to use reason and evidence to do the most good possible for all sentient beings now and in the future. So it's not an ambitious movement at all. Um, but they have had a big impact. They've, they've convinced a lot of billionaires to substantially shift what they fund. If you look at the money donated to animal charities in the US, for example, which is the right graph, the lion's share goes to animal shelters, mostly for dogs or cats, right? Abandoned dogs, cats, nobody wants them. Oh, it's so sad, little doggy's gonna get euthanized. Um, almost nothing goes to labs, almost nothing goes to farm animal well-being. And the other, I don't even know what that is. It, a lot of it's guide dogs for the blind, actually. Versus on the left is the actual number of animals used and killed per year. And the vast majority is farm animals, and the vast majority of them are chickens, right? And almost nobody gives money for the chickens. They give a little, uh, and lab animals are not as big an issue as farm animals, and the number of animals that actually are affected by animal shelters is, is really minuscule. So that's a massive mismatch, right, between where people are giving money versus in a sense where the money is needed if you actually wanted to, to maximize animal welfare. Okay, how much time do I have? Okay, okay. So one big question is when people do virtue signaling, what traits are they really signaling? Well, they're signaling virtue, but what does that mean, really? Um, in, a, in biology, it took a while for us to figure out what these sexual ornaments were actually revealing, right? And we now think, well, it's, it's some combination of genetic quality, you know, and parasite resistance and general phenotypic condition and health and so forth. But it took research to figure out how do you connect, you know, the details and design of this display to, to what actual traits are being advertised and then why does the other sex care about them? Well, one approach would be to ask, if you, if you borrow from moral psychology, uh, it seems like a good place to start if you want to understand the virtues being signaled. Let's study empirically what are the, the virtuous variables that people have. And Jonathan Haidt has done, I think, a great job in The Righteous Mind of studying um, what are the now six key moral foundations that all humans seem to care about, but some humans seem to care more about some than others. In particular, people on the left, liberals, tend to prioritize care, which is reducing harm and promoting well-being, like the effective altruists are trying to do. And liberals promote justice or fairness or proportionality. Um, we saw a previous talk suggesting maybe that's not really a thing, but we can debate that. Conservatives, though, have a broader spectrum of values they, they care about, most of which liberals might not even consider values. Things like liberty or freedom or sovereignty, loyalty to your in-group, your country, your city, your football team, whatever, solidarity, a local community, sanctity, right, a kind of key religious value, purity, holiness, chastity, self-restraint. 
and then authority, respect for power and traditions. And what you'll often see with political rhetoric is one side or the other sort of invoking these values as if they're the only values and then being surprised that people on the other end of the political spectrum or the, the centrists or the, the uncommitted don't get the message. And I think that's a great place to start, but I don't think there's, these are really the deepest things that we're signaling when we're doing consumerist virtue signaling. Um, I've been thinking about this for a while in my four books. All, all these books are really about sexual selection for trait signaling in general including virtue signaling. So I think one nice way into this is to think about the big five personality traits. Now, in the corporate world, for reasons that continue to beggar belief, they are obsessed with the Myers-Briggs personality types. And I have been on a hobby horse making fun of them for a while for that. Nobody's taking those... Myers-Briggs thing seriously in 30 years in personality psych. The big five has been where it's at. Some people argue around the edges. Should we need to go to a sixth trait? Whatever. But the big five are so well established. They're stable, reliable, heritable individual differences. They predict behavior across species, cultures, situations. Hopefully you know what they are. Hands up if you're familiar with the big five. A few of you. Okay. They are openness, conscientiousness, agreeableness, extroversion, and emotional stability. I'll only focus on a couple of those at the moment. I just want to give you a sense of how certain brands and products and companies sort of tap into certain aspects of these so that they allow consumers to advertise one or more of these big five traits. And the interesting thing about these traits is no extreme is necessarily better than the other in all cases, right? So if you score high on the openness to experience trait, that tends to correlate with being politically liberal, supporting multiculturalism, supporting globalism. This is no longer true, is it? It should in principle be. Um, highly open people also tend to be sexually open, so they might be more kinky or polyamorous or whatever. And they're low in disgust. They're not very disgust sensitive in terms of antipathogen disgust, um, sexual disgust, or moral disgust. And there's a lot of brands that like to be associated with those values, those virtues, right? Gary Johnson, libertarian candidate for president. Apple is basically a hundred billion dollars of brand equity that's just associated with openness. Right? That's, the, that's a big part of the company is people look at the Apple thing on your little phone and go unconsciously, ah, oh, highly open people, my kind of people. Um, when Starbucks does a campaign like hashtag race together, right, they're signaling we support multiculturalism and globalism, pro-immigration. Um, Pepsi, for some reason, tends to be more associated with high openness and liberalism than Coca-Cola. Benetton's multicultural ads are clearly an openness appeal. And uh, Google itself right, is both politically uh, leftist by composition and by management and by sort of public relations. The danger, though, is that people who have these values kind of assume, A, those are the right values, and B, everyone else would share them if they were enlightened. Right? So it's very easy to get kind of arrogant to assume we can attract all customers with these pitches, with these particular virtues. Well, no, you can't, because some people are low on openness or high on traditionalism, and they don't like this stuff. They really don't. <clears throat> They like being politically conservative. They like in-group loyalty, nationalism. They like certain kinds of censorship, particularly in the sexual realm. They like vanilla sex, and they like monogamy a lot, I found. Um, like, they really don't like it when I teach a polyamory class. That's another story. Um, and they have pretty high levels of sexual and moral disgust. And those folks gravitate towards brands like Trump, Hobby Lobby, Chick-fil-A, Mary Kay Cosmetics, and Coca-Cola. 
And I think those brands actually have more self-awareness about the virtue signaling that they're doing to their market than some of these brands tend to do. All right. Another big five trait, and this is only uh, this is the last one I'll mention, is agreeableness. Right? If you're highly agreeable, you think being agreeable is awesome. Everyone should be agreeable, tender-hearted, nurturing, having sort of feminine values about interaction style, and being oriented towards others rather than yourself. And so, a lot of um, nonprofit campaigns and brands are associated with high agreeableness, like. Certified vegan, right? Vegans try to be agreeable. My girlfriend's a vegan. She's not always agreeable. Vegans can be very militant vegans, but they think of themselves as being very tenderhearted. Cruelty-free cosmetics, right? That's an agreeableness pitch. Um, the Hillary Clinton ad uh, campaign, I believe in love and kindness, is a pro-agreeableness pitch. Everything that Miley Cyrus promotes, like animal welfare awareness, agreeableness. Um, or Subaru, which has become associated with um, LGBTQ sexuality, right, and, and, and sort of at the forefront of that um, for agreeableness reasons. On the other hand, um, to tough-minded people or protective or masculine or self-oriented people, this all is just sickening. It's all repulsive. It's not the virtues that low agreeableness, i.e. assertive or tough-minded people want to display. They want to display virtues like built tough, or I eat meat, goddammit, because it's what's for dinner. Circular logic, but there we go. Um, or they really love their Heckler & Koch um, uh, modern sporting rifles. Hey, don't call them assault rifles. Modern sporting rifles. No compromise. Even some makeup brands like L'Oreal, because you're worth it, that's a much more narcissistic and, and kind of borderline sociopathic pitch, right, than cruelty-free. Um, and I don't understand the unicorn death metal um, branding, but it, it's kind of like ironic low agreeableness. All right, so last few slides to wrap up. If you work in a corporate environment, it's worth asking, or on your next consulting gig for a company, does your brand strategy explicitly include the virtue signaling strategy that you need? It's hard to do, because most market researchers are politically leftists, and they have a very skewed distribution on these big five personality traits. Right? They tend to be more agreeable than average, more open than average, more conscientious, etc. So unless your marketing team includes true ideological diversity and personality diversity, different political and religious and moral attitudes that truly reflect your consumers, it's really hard to, to tune into their virtue signaling strategy. You'll make a lot of misses. Are you doing your market segmentation by virtue signaling strategies or just by demographics and, and like verbally stated preferences? Are you analyzing your big data in terms of virtue clusters or just in terms of age, sex, race, geography, et cetera? And are your company virtues, your brand virtues, and your product virtues all aligned with each other so that they're all telling a consistent story to consumers, workers, investors, et cetera. Because consumers will punish inconsistencies and hypocrisies and equivocations sooner or later. Right? Like I think Google did take a hit over a couple of misbehaviors recently. I think we can certainly harness these virtue signaling instincts to do well and do good better and more efficiently. Virtue signaling has been kind of a taboo topic, and whenever people you know, accuse somebody else of, oh, you're just virtue signaling, we take it really personally. But I think the right response is, we all do it, bro. We all do it. Uh, the question is, do you do it intelligently or not? Do you do it altruistically or not? So we can ignore it, we can fight it, or we can use it for the greater good. And I think the better we understand it, the better we can design um, and market and build communities around our products that, that make everybody happier. 
So ideally, within five years, people would sort of level up their understanding of virtue signaling enough that, you know, on a date, right, maybe a young woman could say, by the way, I harness my virtue signaling instincts to make consumer purchases that maximize my subjective well-being. Of course, of course. But, but while minimizing avoidable suffering for all sentient beings, to which the proper response should be, let's make babies. <laughs> okay, I'll stop there and let's have some questions. Thank you. I have a question that kind of connects with the last two talks. I, and you kind of got to it a little bit with your agreeableness thing, but I wonder if anybody's ever content analyzed the virtue signals on Twitter by sex and also by content in the sense of are they related to the stuff that Dan talks about, you know, in terms of how, how are men and women differentially likely to express envy or differentially likely to express social justice? Or what was your third one? Compa yeah, well, <coughs> compassion, that's sort of almost, yeah. And so I think, has anybody ever looked at that or have you looked at that? I haven't. Somebody should. I would love to do this. My, I mean, my huge frustration at the moment, honestly, is that the amount of data that the data, they're not really social media companies. They're data refineries. Uh -huh. right? Their point is to get data from us that they sell. Um, data about us, the consumers, for advertising purposes. So the data refineries could probably test any conceivable hypothesis we have about consumer behavior in about four hours, yeah. given the data they have. Um, and maybe they are, maybe they aren't, but they're not, they're not sharing, yeah. and that's sad. Can we do it? I don't know about Twitter, but is it still accessible after it goes up? Does it stay up there? If it doesn't get in the New York Times? Right, so yeah, there, there, there would be ways to scrape data in automated fashion if you have some genius programming savvy postdocs to, uh -huh. to do it, which I don't. All right, good stuff, but thanks. Thank you. Dr. Miller, thank you for the presentation, your brazen appreciation of Zoolander and, uh, the, and the Twitter engagement. Uh, I've been thinking about uh, national virtue signaling in the form of honorary citizenship, and I'm wondering, is there impetus more to appropriate the achievements of the prospective citizen or to be the person or nation to congratulate them first? I think this is a fascinating issue, right? And what I've realized is if you're giving a prize that everybody knows is an awesome prize, like a Nobel Prize, then the person who gets the benefit of the prize being awarded is principally the recipient, right? But if you're a kind of mid-level organization giving a prize to somebody much more famous than you, which could include citizenship, then a benefit is mostly the reflected glory back onto you, the giver, right? Mm -hmm. So if, if you're Moldova and you're like giving honorary citizenship to um, Bill Gates, some, yeah. right, Bill Gates <laughs> or some you know, political dissident who everyone agrees is wonderful and amazing, um, it's basically you, you are virtue signaling, but you're using the, the reflected virtue of the, uh, the prize recipient. And of course, universities do this with honorary degrees all the time. It's really the mid-level universities that need to be able to, de to bestow the honorary doctorates on the much more famous people. So is skin in the game the, uh, the central element here? Because I'll use the Canadian example. We're about to strip Dong San Suu Kyi's uh, honorary citizenship for her uh, inaction in preventing the Rohingya right. Muslim genocide. And uh, I'm wondering, is Canada now seeing a bad return on that uh, on that investment because she's defaulting for all intents and purposes? So I'm wondering what the power dynamics are like there. Yeah, I think you could analyze all kinds of interesting new concepts like virtue defaulting. All right, um, using it. by borrowing all the costly signaling theory from biology and sort of turning it into kind of a more coherent. Um, Science of PR, in a way. Very good. Thank yeah. you so much. I have uh, many questions and thoughts, but uh, uh, time. Uh, so, 
here you have a more or less straightforward story for virtual signaling that doesn't necessarily rely on sexual selection, although there's a domain. And, okay, but so uh, ancestral hunter gatherer bands, uh, you need to become valuable in the eyes of others, otherwise you die. And mm -hmm. uh, So you need to broadcast your goodness, uh, how you're valuable to others, so others uh, value you and place weight on your welfare. Uh, if you don't, you die. And so there's a motion of pride, uh, broadcasting uh, your goodness. So virtue is kind of a, the derogatory, but your goodness, good points. Uh, so other people, okay, so that's one thing. And the other uh, thing that I find interesting is uh, you can dissociate, there's streams of how much so there's uh, different ways in which you can, people can be valuable to you. One is delivering benefits. Uh, one is the extent to which they are willing to pay costs to deliver those benefits. So there's the concept of welfare trade of ratio we've done work on. And we find in the laboratory that people are willing to, f uh, to trade benefits for WTR. In other words, uh, there's a guy willing to, uh, there's a guy that uh, showers you benefits but he doesn't really care too much about your welfare, whereas this, there's these guys who can provide you much more modest benefits. Uh, however, he's willing to sacrifice hugely to be there when you need it, because he really values your welfare. So an ancestral mind might be designed, a more mind where there's uh, healthcare and uh, uh, a high floor of safety and peacefulness and so on, uh, may go with the benefits. As, uh, but on the other hand, an ancestral mind uh, may go with really paying attention to how much people value you and uh, devaluing the benefits. So this may be one route, where ancestral route, whereby we're really tuned to how much people value you, irrespective of the uh, benefits that they're showering you. And yeah, but... Yeah, I think it, even within the... It's not, specific, it's not specific to sexual selection. It yeah. goes through. You, you even see this in the effect of altruism movement, where initially, once they realized it was relatively cheap to save a life like in India or Africa, all the EA aficionados started to become so insanely um, miserly about their own lives and not spending money and, and feeling guilty about anything they spent, that they all kind of ended up looking like skinny and jaundiced and like living in terrible little little flats and and driving terrible cars. And I think it was this kind of runaway signaling of the welfare trade-off ratio willingness. It's like, dudes, you guys aren't even doing that much good for your intended audience. You're just showing how much you're willing to give up health and mental health and everything and then they kind of got through that phase and went okay everybody just chill out you don't need to live like a hermit to do maximum good and in fact you'll do more good if you're in better shape and live a better life and um so they kind of overcorrected and and now i think they're back to a more rational place but i think there is this human tendency to, to act like I'm not doing good unless I'm suffering. It's very persuasive to attach, uh, to relate virtue signaling strategies to personality. But if that is the cause, why do you think there are geographical splits, urban, rural, central, coastal? Well, I, I mean, there are different personality trait distributions, like geographically. Um, caused mostly at this point, at least within the U.S., by selective migration, right? If you're just a highly open person, you are not going to stay in Kansas past undergrad. Um, but I think certainly personality traits don't explain everything about virtue signaling, because you can get rapid, rapid changes, fads and fashions and virtue signals, and underlying personality traits aren't changing. It's just there's a new fad about how do I display openness, right? Um, how do I display agreeableness? Well, in the case of sort of the social justice community, it's what is this year's pet cause? Right? You have to keep up. What's the pet cause this year? Like trans rights, that was so 2017. What is it this year? Um, and if you're not on board, then you're not, you're not doing effective virtue signaling. So the personality traits is just one window into this, but I, I don't think it's the whole the whole explanation by any means. Hi. Thanks again. Very interesting talk. And thanks for keeping it nice and simple. Um, so I was wondering, we've been talking a lot about uh, virtue signaling towards others. 
what role is there for virtue signaling towards oneself? So, for example, you had the example with the coffee grinds where you might go out and buy something that's carbon emission free and so forth. How much of that is because you want to signal to others and how much of that is sort of you want to make yourself feel like a good person? Yeah, good question. I think, I mean, ultimately most of the self-signaling is in the service of others, but what it does is it sort of compiles a record over time of your virtuous behavior that you can then kind of um, turn into an overall kind of um, kind of subjective estimate of how good a person am I, and then you can broadcast that. So I think a lot of the moral licensing work where, oh, I did this good thing, now I'm free to do this bad thing, I think that has a lot to do with, I did this good th Is this, uh, okay. Good, good, cool. Uh, so it's easy to determine if a person is being, uh, is signaling, you know, their, their moral superiority or whatever it is. But when you look at the marketplace, how would you determine whether a company is trying to, quote, virtue signal or, in fact, just do something that would give them a competitive edge, right? So, like, with the coffee example, it helps me as a consumer if I know, if, if the company's a little bit more transparent as to where, the, you know, their, their raw materials are coming from, I might choose that product over the other. So, in a sense, I feel like if you look, if you're looking at the marketplace, you could attach virtue signaling to almost any decision that's made, but at a certain point, how do you distinguish what is, quote, virtue signaling and what is maybe just a good decision to, to, to you know, to be the better, the better market offering? Yeah, I mean, the gray area is, is the PR area. So I, did, I consulted with a really big um, American retailer for, for a minute for their, their foundation, which gives a lot of money to charity. And I kind of tried to convince them that EA was, was ideally the way to go if they actually want to maximize the amount of good they do. And I gave them a bunch of reasons for that. And their response basically was, we are not interested in anything that won't sell to our customers and our employees as things that are relevant virtue signals or relevant ways of doing good. Right. So you can make a pitch, well, you could save 20 times as many lives if you did this other thing rather than supporting this cause. And their response would be, but our customers don't care about those people. We know we could save more lives over there, but our customers don't care, our employees don't care. So. Is that a business-based decision? Kind of. Is it pure virtue signaling? No, because they are, you know, allegedly giving money for maybe a net positive good cause. But the point is their decision making is not being driven by how do we actually help the most people in the best ways. Um, but between is it a rational decision, a uh, rational business decision versus um, reacting to what the public would want them to do versus reacting to a misunderstanding of what the public wants. Those are gray areas that, that are pretty hard to sort out. Does that answer your yeah, question? Just, okay. yeah, awesome. Thank you. Okay.